My guest today is Kate Gregory. Kate, how are you? Great. Good to be here. Uh, it's great to have you here. I, uh, I've heard your name for many years, and I finally got to meet you in person, so this is really exciting for me. Yeah, it's been it's been the same thing for me. I know who that person is, but we haven't met. So is now this we exciting know. for you as yeah, well? Yeah, sure. I thought. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do, Kate? Uh, I have a little consulting firm in Ontario. Um, I help people be better at software development, and these days mostly in C++. C++, that's interesting. I've, I've sort of resigned myself to never learning C++. Does that make me a bad person? No, it makes you a lucky person. <laughs> because if you want to learn C++ now, you can skip the older, much harder, and more difficult version of C++. Did I say that I wanted to learn yeah. C++? No, but should you want to? Should I want to? Uh, you know, you could have learned this really old hard thing, and then in order to code now, we'd be all like, forget that. That was the old hard way. Here's the new easy way. Oh, okay. And you'd resent the time you put into learning that. Oh, okay. And that, well, I never did learn. So I was not a computer science major, I guess is the issue. So I, I just got into, I got some job writing code and it wasn't C++. Yeah, was, we all do that. I mean, it was it was Foxpro, <laughs> which abstracts away a lot of sure. the, the the low level stuff. And now it's C sharp or JavaScript, which abstracts away even more. So parts of C++ are very high level and full of abstraction. Mm -hmm. You know, it can you can drop down. Uh, you can drop a long way down if you really want to, but that's really what sets modern C++ apart from the older style is that people are embracing more abstractions, embracing more of a high level way of thinking about problems. Oh, okay. So in other words, if you um, you don't have to do the really hard things, like managing pointers, for example. Exactly. That everybody pulls so their hair out over. One of the things that used to be really popular to teach in like an intro to C++ course is writing some loop that is incrementing a pointer or subtracting two pointers or doing some kind of manipulation in order to like traverse the collection. And it's not that that code wouldn't compile today, it would. Mm -hmm. But a better way to do things is by having a collection, especially one that just comes in a library that comes with your compiler, okay. and going through that in um, a way that describes itself to the person who's reading it. Okay. So uh, in C++11, we added the ranged for, which is like a for each. It's exactly once through every element of a collection. Hmm. And also, we've had forever, but people haven't been using until more recently, a uh, standard library of algorithms. So if you want to go through a collection and find something okay. or whatnot, rather than writing your loop and then hand comparing your elements, just call this function called find that returns you an iterator that's pointing to the thing you found. Well, that makes sense. There's a, a lot of people probably had their own sets of those libraries, and they were just maintaining them. But Well, they had them in their heads them. as idioms. So or, they would they the, would write the 10-line loop. Like include files that they could just call? Is that In many cases, people really enjoyed writing these loops, it oh, seems, and reading these loops. And, and there's a cognitive burden. I mean, it doesn't take a long time to read through a loop and go, oh, yeah. Oh, you're finding the first odd one. Okay, I get it. Or the, you're finding uh, all the high priority ones. But if you call a function f i n d, it's sort of a subtle hint as to what it does. I'm gonna guess it finds <laughs> yeah, something. you know, or <laughs> or count or sort or yeah, something. Yeah. Hmm, I wonder what this does. So you know, modern C++, you know, the best code is code you don't have to write or test. So yep. if you can rely on library code, rely on library code. And if you can't rely on library code, then refactor it into a function because then it has a name and then people know what it does. So, so you're saying that C++ is an evolving language. It's even, uh, it's not like Latin where people speak it, but it never changes. That's right. It does, it does evolve. Does it evolve as fast as, say, C Sharp or JavaScript or Java? In some ways it can evolve faster, but in other ways it's slower. So we had C++ 98, and then C++03 was a very small modification. And then we waited a long time and we got C++11. And mm -hmm. these years refer to the ISO Standards Committee actually releasing an official standard C++ that all the different compiler vendors need to comply to. Oh, that's interesting. That's very different from C Sharp, for example. That's where right. Microsoft has a team. You know, Anders declares these that's right. are the features we're going to add. They own the language. They have a meeting. They decide what to add. In mm -hmm. C++, it's more complex. So there's okay. an, a whole standards process with national bodies and international meetings twice a year and mailing lists of papers and proposals and all of those things. Tell me about the standards bodies. The C++ language is actually standardized by ISO by the International Standards Organization. And there's a committee. 
And it's an international committee that's made up of all different national bodies, and people come and vote on, you know, what will or will not be changed about the language. Hmm. Uh, so the the one individual who sat down one day and wrote the language, Bjarna, is still very active in the committee, but it is very definitely a committee thing. And they sometimes do things he doesn't want them to do. <laughs> oh, then they discuss. <laughs> it, you know, he's not he's not the dictator of the language. So uh-huh. if the committee as a whole wants to do something, that's what happens. And then. Different compiler vendors, when something's proposed, it may take years to make it into the standard, but a compiler vendor might implement it right away. Oh, interesting. Okay. So you may be able to use certain features like, oh, I'm a Visual C++ user, so I want to do these coroutines as a a better way of handling asynchronicity, basically like a wait, uh, but for C++. Well, if I'm a Visual C++ user, I can do that because Microsoft is heavily involved in that proposal. If I'm using a different C++ compiler, I might not be able to. But maybe the people in those C++ compilers can use some other upcoming feature that that particular compiler has chosen to implement. Interesting. Are, are you mostly using the Microsoft compiler? Yes, I'm a long-time Visual C++ user, okay. and I have a lot of clients who are heavily invested in Microsoft's libraries. Uh, what are the other compilers out there? So there's Clang, which you'll see a lot of Apple people using. Okay, that's C language, I guess. Is yeah, sure. and GCC, which I think is GNU C++ compiler, so but, but I won't thing. swear to it. Yeah, All pretty right. much. But I mean, the IDEs and the compilers are separate, so you could run Clang from inside Visual Studio. Oh, I see. And there's also Visual Studio Code, mm-hmm. which is a cross-platform IDE uh, with and there's, Visual Was there C++. a plug-in then that yes. has the compiler? That's right. So you can you can put the tools that you want. And you can choose that. which compiler depending on which plug-in you add. I'm, I'm not 100% sure for VS Code whether it supports other compilers, but I know that Visual well, which Studio Which tools does. do you use? I use Visual Studio on Windows a lot because that happens to be the mix of clients that I attract. Okay. Because if you've been building your application around a, a library like MFC, which has been with us for well over 20 years, right. um, you can't just decide to port that to Unix tomorrow. Ah. Is there a reason why I should learn C++? I'm mid-career, and uh, I've got some other languages that I'm comfortable with. I meet people a lot of times who want to start to learn C++, and the attraction is always that it is the most general purpose and most cross-platform. So. We like to say there's one planet in our solar system that's populated entirely by robots, which is Mars, and all of those robots run C++. Ah. But C++... I want, I want to fit it with those guys. That's right. <laughs> but C++ is used for huge numerical computations, assimilations of finances and weather, things where speed and performance are incredibly important. But it's also used in very small things where the performance isn't about instructions per second, but about instructions per watt, about battery life. Oh, okay. So literally, jewelry, programmable jewelry, is programmed in C++. And it was hmm. super inspiring to meet 12-year-olds who are learning C++ so they can program their jewelry. Interesting. Yeah. Well, so, so I guess um, the, well, the answer to the question is, if I want to do that kind of optimization, where I run into limits of um, power, or you didn't mention uh, memory, I guess it would be. But a, that's a, also a, part of that control memory of memory. Or yeah. uh, um, speed. That's when I would say, you know, now is a time I really need to. That learn that's C++. where the appeal is. Okay. If you want to be able to control some aspect of your performance, either in the very large or in the very small, and there are some platforms where C++ is the language for that platform. Just as you know, if you want to write for uh, the Android phone, well, what are you going to learn? Uh, Java. Right. If you want to write for the iPhone or, 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 or uh, Kotlin or uh, Xamarin. Yeah. But if <laughs> but you want to write for the iPhone. Okay, and right? Swift. Yeah. And so there's no particular large thing where you can say, oh, the only way to write for that is to learn C++. Yeah, but some microcontrollers, that's true. Right. But all of those things can be targeted with C++. And so if you know C++, you have that as an option. Oh, I see. So C++ is the ultimate cross-platform language is what you're telling me. Yeah. Yeah, uh, definitely. So if I had learned that, I would there would be I'd be asking the question, is there any reason for me to learn anything <laughs> any other else? Language, possibly, yes. <laughs> uh, which well, I'll ask somebody else that question. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, do you write in other languages besides C++? Oh, sure. I mean, you know, the whole first uh, decade of this century, I was heavily into all of the .NET languages. Uh-huh. Um, I did have a, a Java time. Uh, I actually got fed up with the way Java was changing because hmm. someone would just decide you know, we're going to change the language in this way, and I would have to learn a new thing. And oh, well, that's true of C-sharp as well, right? It I mean, is. It just is it, felt, it felt abrupt from okay. Java and less so from C-sharp, but that could be because I'm kind of a little bit of an insider. But as an MVP, as an RD, yep. sort of hear what's coming down the pipe, and it's not 
quite as uh, shocking. But I think maybe also Microsoft learned to make those changes a little more gradually. And uh, certainly in the last few years, they've, uh, they've done a better job of uh, incorporating feedback and uh, exactly. more quickly in the, than they did in the past. You are... I think the person most well known with Microsoft C++. I don't think there's anybody else on planet Earth uh, that th- uh, that speaks and writes about this more than you. Is that a fair statement? That doesn't work for Microsoft. That it doesn't definitely work for Microsoft. De- definitely okay. true. That, yeah. All right, and you're speaking all around the world about this, right? Yes. What's what's going on for you? Um, I I've been traveling quite a lot the last year or so, mm-hmm. and I've been uh, going to conferences that didn't used to exist. I was just commiserating. Uh, with a friend online the other day, and it's wonderful that there are so many C++ conferences that we cannot go to them all. Right. Uh, there didn't used to be any. Hmm. And uh, then CppCon uh, came about. That's that's in Seattle in the fall. Okay. Uh, meeting C++ is in Berlin a little later in the fall. But there are uh, C++-oriented conferences like ACCU, which some people say ACU in England. And it's got plenty of not C++ content, but plenty of C++ content as well. And there are other newer C++ conferences. It seems like they're springing up all over. So I'm delighted to be able to go to some of those. What aspects of C++ do you talk about at these conferences? Whatever I'm excited about. So uh, I made a bit of a splash a number of years ago with a talk called Stop Teaching C, which didn't mean that no one should learn C or program in C. Mm -hmm. If you want to learn C, I think that's fantastic. But I was having a real reaction to an intro to C++ course, which is like day one, C. Day two, more C. Uh, Day three, okay, forget all that. (laughs) And I felt that we were wasting a lot of precious instructional time teaching people, you know, old-fashioned ways to do things that were not modern. Hmm. And that if we focused on C++ from day one, we could get a lot further into C++ and cover some things that intro courses don't always get to. Okay, are you talking about the object-oriented aspects of C++? Object orientation, but also templates, exceptions, uh, the sorts of things that make C++ C++ and not okay. Java or Kotlin or Objective-C or what have you. You know, every language has its own things. Yes. And a lot of people teach C++ kind of in chronological order. So they start with the things that were in C, and then they move on to sort of C++03 or 98 material, and then they cover some things that were added in C++11 like lambdas. And they sort of, that, that's not how you use a language based on mm. when a feature was added. I see. Um, I was teaching C++ when const was added as a keyword, and I had people who were using compilers that didn't support the, the keyword. It made, it made exercises really hard to write. Right. <laughs> so I understand the motivation behind adding the new stuff at the end of your course, right. but th- I was really passionately advocating for teaching things in a more logical order. And, and for example, not teaching pointers until after references. Hmm, okay. References are really easy to understand. As if someone knows another programming language, they get references right away. Mm-hmm. You can get through all of that and polymorphism and all of those, and then later talk about pointers. And people with C backgrounds are horrified when I say to do this, but it really works. I mean, the proof is in the pudding. Where can people go to learn more about C++? There is actually now a website called isocpp.org, which is the website of the Standards Committee and of the C++ Foundation, which supports C++. It's got getting started, where can you get a compiler, where can you get tools, Books, videos, articles, it's a great starting place. Where can people learn more about Kate Gregory? Oh, I have this sadly neglected website, uh, gregcons.com for Gregory Consulting. Uh, your best bet's probably to follow me on Twitter, gregcons. And uh, I post links to just about everything interesting I'm doing on there. I will do that today. All right. Kate Gregory, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> I've seen an awful lot of changes in technology. I've been paid to program since 1979, and things change a lot. But the one thing that doesn't change is it's a way to connect to the people that matter to me, to my friends. Whether it's a conference flying me to another continent and me getting to see my friends there, or whether it's just staying online through one of the 73 products I seem to have open at any given time for talking to people, uh, there's always a powerful way to stay in touch with your friends.